We're going to read from John 19, beginning at the second half of verse 16. God's word declares, So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the, law, of the Jews protested to the Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. The garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, They divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there, And the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of a hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath, because the Jewish leaders did not want bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. These things happened so that the scriptures would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one that they have pierced. This is the word of God. Well, throughout the beginning of our year together, we've been studying the Gospel of John, looking at the encounters that Jesus has had with other individuals and sometimes with small groups. I hope that as we've done this, we've been developing a deeper understanding and appreciation of who Jesus is and what he accomplished on this earth. By looking through the eyes of those who met him, we gain a different insight perhaps into Jesus and his ministry. This morning, being Good Friday, we're of course going to look at the crucifixion, the death of our Lord. But in particular, this morning, I want to look at the interactions that Jesus has from the cross by considering the words that Jesus spoke from the cross. Now, John doesn't record all seven sayings that Jesus had from the cross. They are scattered throughout the different Gospels. We'll simply be concerning ourselves with the one that, ones that John has recorded. Now, I want you to recall that last Sunday we spoke about Pilate who was there to try Jesus and who by all accounts found him innocent. Pilate had begun to recognize who Jesus was which is why he wrote the sign the king of the Jews and placed it above Jesus' head on the cross. 
And it is with that declaration above him that Jesus is crucified. And as John continues in his gospel, we need to see that he doesn't dwell on the details of the crucifixion. Crucifixion was a traumatic and violent event, to say the least. The root word from which we get crucifixion is the same from which we get the English word excruciating. It was utter torture, utter pain, and yet John doesn't mention those things. He simply recalls that Jesus was crucified. Instead, John focuses on how Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. He does it in a number of different ways through the passage that I just read. And indeed, his initial focus at the time of the crucifixion is not on the blood, the anguish, the pain that might attract our attention, but rather on the division of Jesus' garments. He said, when the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, each, sorry, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. The garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it. Let's decide by lot who will get it. John recalls that this happened, that scripture might be fulfilled. Scripture that said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garments. I read the beginning of Psalm 22 at the start of our service this morning. Picking up again from verse 11 where we left off in Psalm 22, that psalm continues. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Roaring lions that tear their prey open their mouths against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax and has melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me, a pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. But you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild ox. I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. And so the psalm continues in the vein of praise. John recording this gospel is ever familiar with the Old Testament and we have seen as we have worked our way through this gospel that he regularly alludes to illustrates or quotes from the Old Testament and here again he is showing us that even as his clothes were divided as Jesus was nailed to the cross things were unfolding just as God had intended John is showing us here that Jesus is once more the fulfillment of the promises and prophecies that God laid down in his scriptures, in our Old Testament. What the world around us and what the people around Christ at the time of the crucifixion failed to see is that this was God's plan for Christ and in Christ. It was all unfolding just as God intended. Jesus, here being crucified, is completing a task that his father gave him. A task that was his and his alone. A task that God had declared would come about centuries in advance. And as Christ nears the completion of his task, 
hanging on the cross, he speaks. In John 19, we're at verse 25 when Jesus speaks. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, the disciple took her into his home. Now, of course, Jesus' mother is identified here, not named as Mary, lest there be more confusion with the number of Marys surrounding the cross. We're also told that there is one disciple, the disciple whom Jesus loved, that has remained faithful and has stood at the foot of the cross. Scholars believe that this disciple is John himself, the one whose gospel we have been studying, the only of the apostles who came to witness the crucifixion and death of Jesus, while the rest lay in hiding. It's important to note for this interaction, this encounter as well, that Jesus' earthly father, Joseph, has long since been considered dead. There's no record of Joseph's death in our scriptures, but it is understood and believed by many that some of the language around Jesus being Joseph's son indicates that Joseph had passed away already. Jesus, as the eldest son of Mary, is by Jewish law the one who is take, to take responsibility for her care. And nailed to that cross, he knows that very soon, and indeed now, he is unable to care for her as he should. And so he passes on the responsibility of Mary's care. Now usually, this responsibility would be passed to another family member, another brother. And we know that Jesus did indeed have brothers, James and Jude at least, and perhaps others. But Jesus on the cross does not give Mary's care over to one of her sons, but rather he chooses John, who is not a relative of Mary. The question, of course, is why does Jesus do this? I think the most compelling answer is that Jesus is himself compelled primarily by Mary's spiritual well-being. You see, at this time, his brothers have not yet come to faith. They have dismissed Jesus as crazy. They have shunned him as an outcast in their family. And so here on the cross, in one of the few things Jesus says, he hands the care of his mother to the disciple whom he loves and trusts. What Christ is showing us here, what Christ is demonstrating in his own words, is that the unity shared between believers is stronger than even the family relations. For Jesus, Mary's spiritual well-being, being cared for by a fellow believer in what will be a time of trial for her faith, is the most important priority. You may have heard the expression that blood is thicker than water. It's used in our modern language to indicate that family ties are stronger than friendships. But it is truer to say that the blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb. We who have been united in the blood of Christ that ran down that very cross as he spoke these words share more in common than any who came from the same womb as you. Indeed, more so than the one who gave you birth, unless they too are a believer. The family of God is one of the great priorities that Christ had in coming to earth, to draw to himself children of God. And whilst it is a simple expression that he says from the cross, there is a great depth to its meaning. 
he continues to say just two more things in John's gospel. In verse 28 of John 19. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it and put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. Again, John takes pains to point out that Christ in his death and crucifixion fulfilled the scriptures. Jesus' words, I am thirsty, says John, indicate that scripture is being fulfilled. Now it may be another echo of Psalm 22 where the psalmist declared that their mouth was dried, that the tongue stuck to the roof of their mouth. But there is perhaps more to this. Perhaps it is that Jesus is seeking some sort of fluid so that he might have strength for his final words. He seeks a drink to somewhat revive him before he speaks his last. And he is given, we're told, wine vinegar. Wine vinegar was a bitter tasting stimulant, something that would reawaken Jesus and in fact enhance his pain. Where previously he had been offered wine mixed with myrrh, a sedative that he refused, he now drinks that which would awaken him. As Jesus says, I thirst, and takes this drink, it shows, of course, that he was and is very much human. It reveals to us that his suffering is really painful, that his weakness, humanly speaking, is evident. We are reminded in these simple words that Jesus truly took on flesh, truly is a man. But he also, as John says, points us back once more to Scripture. This time to Psalm 69. In Psalm 69, picking up from verse 16, we read, Answer me, Lord. Out of the goodness of your love, in your great mercy, turn to me. Do not hide your face from your servant. Answer me quickly, for I am in trouble. Come near and rescue me. Deliver me because of my foes. You know how I am scorned, disgraced, and shamed. All of your enemies are before you. Scorn has broken my heart and has left me helpless. I looked for sympathy, but there was none. For comforters, but I find none. They put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. May the table set before them become a snare. May it become retribution and a trap. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see. Their backs be bent forever. Pour out, on, pour out your wrath on them. Let your fierce anger overtake them. May their place be deserted. Let there be no one to dwell in their tents. For they persecute those you wound and talk about the pain of those you hurt. Charge them with crime upon crime. Do not let them share in your salvation. May they be blotted out from the book of life and not be listed with the righteous. But as for me, afflicted and in pain, May your salvation, God, protect me. Psalm 69 is a psalm in which the psalmist cries out for God to bring vengeance on his enemies. Psalm 69 is a psalm that reminds us that God has wrath to pour out on the sinner and the condemned. And as he asks for a drink, as he uses the words, I thirst, and as he recalls, Psalm 69, 21, they put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. Christ heightens our expectations of wrath. And perhaps as he is hanging on the cross for one who knew the Old Testament well, they would anticipate a moment where God would save Jesus from the cross and indeed pour out his wrath on those around, those who had done this to him. But of course we know that that is not how the story continues. Rather it is Jesus who bears the wrath. Jesus who suffers the scorn. Jesus who experiences death in the place of life. Jesus who experiences the father turning away.
As his words recall the words of this psalm, we are reminded again of what it is that Christ is achieving on the cross. Taking all of that wrath and punishment that would rightly be directed at us and instead focusing it on himself. And having been reinvigorated by that bitter wine, we read on. In verse 30, John 19, when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Jesus' final words recorded prior to his death by the disciple that Jesus loved the word, it is finished. The question, of course, is what is finished? Now, throughout the Gospel of John, we have seen that Jesus came with a variety of purposes. Just a few that I will list off quickly. Jesus declared, John six thirty eight, I have come down from heaven... Not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. He came to do the Father's will. John 12, 46. I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me will not remain in darkness. Jesus came to bring light into our dark world. John 18, 37. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth, that everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. He came. To speak and declare the truth. John 6.51 I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread they will live forever. The bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. He came to give himself that we might live. John 9.39 Jesus said for judgment I came into this world that those who do not see may see and those who see may become blind. He came to judge. John 3.16, perhaps most well known, For God so loved the world, he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Christ came to display the love of God. John 14.16.17, I will ask the Father, he will give you a helper to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. Jesus says, unless I go, the Spirit will not come. He came to give us the Holy Spirit. And at the beginning of John's Gospel, we may recall the words of 1.14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus came to reveal God's glory. There are many reasons that Christ came, many ministries that he had on earth. And in this moment, yes, they are all finished, completed, concluded. But sitting behind the word that Jesus spoke is an even deeper meaning. Our English translation, it is finished, could equally be translated completed or paid in full. It is the Greek word teteleste, which... Alex has on his shirt this morning. You can see its spelling when he stands to sing shortly. It is a word that was spoken at the conclusion of an atoning sacrifice. As a priest would enter into a holy place and sacrifice an animal to pay for the sin of those around, he would return from the task declaring, It is finished, paid in full. Sin had been atoned for, at least for the next season of life. As Jesus hangs on that cross and declares with his final words, it is finished. He is declaring the great truth that in his death, atonement has been made. Sacrifice for sin has been made and the debt is paid in full. 
That truth is why we can call this day Good Friday. To those around and to our mind, this day is not a good day. The death of an innocent man, a brutal, bloody crucifixion, is not a good thing. But that sin is paid in full, that is good news. As we go about the remainder of our days, as we anticipate the resurrection come this Sunday, which we will, of course, celebrate together, let's give praise to Christ that through his death, our debt has been paid in full and it is finished. Would you join with me in prayer? Our Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the gift of Jesus. We thank you for his life and ministry for the many tasks and purposes for which he came, all fulfilled according to your good purposes and in his strength. But we thank you mostly, Lord, that on the cross he could declare it is finished. That debt has been paid, sin atoned for, forgiveness won, life offered, We pray that we would know that more this day and that we might be emboldened to share it with others around us who do not yet know it. May they too be drawn in to the blood of the covenant, the strongest bond that there is on this earth and in the heavens. We ask this that Jesus might be known and glorified and pray it in his name. Amen.